Thank you very, very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, could we please turn off the lights? Can you get the lights? Huh? Yeah, yeah, just turn them off. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Today I will be talking to you about what happens when we don't take care of each other. On August 24th, in the middle of World War II, while Germany was attacking Great Britain, Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill addressed the people of Great Britain, and he spoke to them about the German invasion of Russia. Russia. And this is what he had to say. The aggressor, and by this he meant the German military, retaliates by the most frightful cruelties as his armies advance, whole districts are being exterminated. Scores of thousands, literally scores of thousands of executions in cold blood are being perpetrated by the German police troops upon the Russian patriots who defend their native soil. Since the Mongol invasion of Europe in the 16th century, there has never been methodical merciless butchery on such a scale or approaching such a scale. And this is but the beginning. Famine and pestilence have yet to follow in the bloody ruts of Hitler's tanks. We are in the presence of a crime without a name. It took many, many years until a proper name could be found. And the name is the Holocaust. And I'm here to speak about it today. But before we speak about the Holocaust, there are few questions which we have to answer. The first question, obviously, is what do the words Holocaust and Shoah mean? And both words can be used completely interchangeably. Holocaust comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew word, of a Hebrew word, and it consists of two words, holos, which means hall, and kostos means to burn. It means a whole burnt offering. In other words, a totally useless killing. A killing that does not serve God or does not serve man. And shoah is Hebrew. It simply means disaster or tragedy. So you can use both words. So what was the Holocaust? The Holocaust was the Nazis' destruction of selected groups and their culture. The Nazis didn't just randomly shoot people, but they robbed their museums, their houses of worship, and then burned them down. Do we have any proof that the Holocaust happened? Sure, we have uh, mass graves, we have witnesses, we have what's left of concentration camps, we have uh, documents, US documentation. Every time a concentration camp was liberated by American forces, they took photographs, they interviewed people, they filmed, they kept artifacts, and we also have trials of murderers. Yet despite all of these proofs, there are still people who walk around and who say the Holocaust didn't exist. It was a great lie. So who are these Holocaust deniers? Holocaust deniers are people who hate all who are not exactly like them. In other words, they feel that this is the proper way to treat Jewish men, this is the proper way to treat gay people, and this is the top, proper way to treat people of color. Holocaust deniers believe that they imagine supremacy as a master race justifies the murder of everybody else. Never ever debate a Holocaust denier. Don't do it. Don't even start, don't even think about it, because truth does not need a defense. 
So, what really caused the Holocaust? In the early, in the late 1920s, there were huge financial problems throughout the world. Particularly, we had it here in America, and they had it in Europe. There was the crash of the stock market, there was widespread unemployment, there was devaluation of money. And in Germany, they had a leader who had a very simple solution. Create a super Germany. Create a super Germany and eliminate all imagined enemies. So who were these enemies? They were communists, political opponents, critics, writers, artists, and the inferior and useless. Who are the inferior and who are the useless? Well, Jews, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, gypsies, black people, communists, and gays, they were considered inferior. And handicapped people were considered useless. And then they were gathered and murdered. Of course, we consider this as intolerance. And what all of us are looking for is really tolerance. But we don't want tolerance. Tolerance means to put up with something. What we want is acceptance. Accept people regardless of color, race, sexual orientation, age, origin, religion, or sex. And we can't do anything about any of these things. These are God-given elements by which with how we've been created. And bullying for any of these reasons is called a hate crime. And the shortest penalty is 18 months in jail, even if you're under 16. Nobody in this room, by looking at these boxes, would say for sure which of them contains gold and which contains garbage. Yet many of you just by looking at people, seem to know exactly who is good and who is bad. Would you like to be judged for college admission based on your looks? Of course not. So why, join, uh, why judge other people? The next question which we have is, of course, was the Holocaust the battle? of Christians against Jews. That's how it's very often being presented. We know that six million Jews died. But what is really, really, really bad is that we forget that roughly six million Christians and Muslims died too. Altogether, roughly 12 million people were murdered. If I were to ask you to imagine 12 million people, you couldn't. The number is much, much, much too large. We can't imagine that. So let's do this. Let's line up 12 million people, one person behind the other, and allow one foot three inches for each person. That's roughly the length of your arm. And if he started that line in New York City, that line would stretch across the Midwest, the Rocky Mountains, all the way to California. That's 12 million people. Roughly 6 million died in various concentration camps, and the other 6 million in various killing fields in Ukraine and other countries. Were all the killings done by the Germans? No. Every single nation that Germany occupied provided collaborator killing units. Every single one of them, with the exception of one, Bulgaria. So how was it possible 
for so much evil to succeed. It has been said that all that is necessary for evil to succeed is that good people do nothing. When Hitler and his Nazi party came to power in 1933, and they were burning books by American, British, German authors, the good people did nothing. When they arrested people and put them into camps, the good people did nothing. Nobody said a word. When they banned paintings by Van Gogh and Picasso and called them degenerate art, the good people did nothing. When they lined up Catholic priests and shot them, the good people did nothing. When they arrested people of color and put them into concentration camps, the good people did nothing. When they lined up gypsies and shot them, the good people did nothing. And these were the biggest enemies of Germany. These were the biggest. Because when these little children grow up, they too will have children. But if you arrest all these little children and murder them, there will be no more little children. And one and a half million little children were murdered. They wiped out entire towns, such as Lidice in Czechoslovakia, they dug up the cemetery, they shot all the men, and they poisoned in wagons all the children. These <coughs> nurses and doctors, and their nurses and doctors, worked for Operation T4, and they murdered 270,000 people because they were old, they were handicapped, or they were, had mental diseases. 270,000 people. Here are some of the people who were persecuted. Specific authors, Catholic priests, Jews, gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, gay people, even farmers who ate food. And the good people did nothing. So, what kind of a people were the Nazis? The Nazis were cowards. They wrote anonymous letters. They sent these letters to the newspapers and government offices, and many people committed suicide. Today we call it cyberbullying. It's exactly the same thing, and today, Quite a few teenagers are committing suicide because of that. Nazis were bullies who belonged to government organized gangs. They dressed the same way, they combed their hair the same way. They, Nazis were vandals, they painted on windows and on walls just like people still do right now in your community and in other community. They had fun. Here you see young boys terrorizing an old man, just like these seven Long Island bullies who were involved in 2008 in the murder of an immigrant. And the Nazis knew one thing for sure, that the bystanders protect the bullies. So the more bystanders you have, the more the bullies were protected. Here you have two Jewish students standing in front of a blackboard where somebody had written, the Jews are our biggest enemy. Here Jews have to scrub a sidewalk. People like seeing other people on the ground, just like some of you may enjoy seeing somebody picking up his books from this floor. 
Nazis looked for ways to oppress others. So they had just against the Jews alone over 2,000 rules, such as the public was forbidden to buy from Jews. So they had outside Jewish stores big signs which says, Germans, defend yourself. Don't shop from Jews. Jews were fired by all hospitals, schools, colleges, and corporations. We can't imagine in this country somebody being fired because of their religion or their background. Yet it wasn't too long ago when we had signs like these all over the United States. And we had signs like these. And we had signs like these. Don't ever think that we are not familiar with this type of hate. Jews got a big J stamped on their identification card. And they got a new middle name. If you were a man, it was Israel. And if you were a woman, it was Sarah. And this is the way a Jewish passport looked like, with a big J for Jew. Jews had to wear a yellow star, like this. And if, you, if your name was Anne Frank and you lived in Holland, well, this is the way the star looked. They had signs like these, caution, Jews in village. They had special benches for Jews. It wasn't too long ago when we had spe special benches for black people in this country. We had special water fountains, and we had special seats in the movie houses. Jews were placed in camps and in ghettos, and the good people did nothing. So why didn't the Jews fight back? Because for every one Jew, there were 133 Germans. Not much of a fighting chance, is there? So how did the Germans develop this hate against the Jews? The Germans dehumanized the Jew. They showed them like a worm. They showed them like a snake and like a caterpillar. And if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. How about a cartoon like this? Here the Jew is a spider. Now, this cartoon is not from Germany. This cartoon is right here from the United States, from a newspaper called White Alien Resistance. And you can subscribe to it. It's published today out in California. And in it you have cartoons like this. Of course, the Jews tried to escape from Europe. So you had a big, big conference, a big meeting, where representatives of every nation, you can imagine, 32 nations got together and they decided who was going to accept the Jews. And the Canadian representative said, let the Germans solve their Jewish problem. It's not ours. Why should we be involved in it? And as a result of this, only one country, the Dominican Republic, accepted refugees. That's it. In other words, the good people did nothing. And when the Germans heard that the world didn't give a damn about the Jews, in the night of the broken glass, and in one single night, untold number of homes were ransacked, 7,000 businesses were destroyed, 1,700 houses of worship were destroyed or vandalized, 30,000 people were arrested, and within a month, 1,000 were murdered. Then the Jews were fined for these riots. And the good people did nothing. There was one country that opened its arms to refugees, to children. That was Great Britain. They saved about 9,800 children under the age of 17. None of them could go with their parents. 
most of these children never saw their parents again. There was resistance in Germany. Hans Scholl and his sister Sophie and their friends Christopher Probst. They wrote six flyers over a six months period. They were arrested in the morning, sentenced to death by lunchtime and killed by the evening. In January 1942, Himmler announced the final solution to the Jewish question and six million Jews were eventually executed. And then World War II came about and nothing could be done anymore. In 1933, my father was a mechanical and an electrical engineer and he lost his job. My sister and I, we couldn't go to school anymore. We lived in Berlin, Germany. And so we escaped from Germany to Yugoslavia, three countries away. And this is a picture of my sister and myself in 1933. I used to be adorable. <laughs> we moved to a beautiful town called Zagreb, but we immediately run into problems. First of all, the country didn't need any engineers, and we also had to learn Croat and Serbian. It was very, very difficult for my parents. I'm gonna give you some homework. Ask one of your foreign-born friends, how many languages do they speak? What did their parents do for a living in their home country? And how did it start in this country? And what problems did your friend have? Sit down and listen to them. And then you'll understand the problems of the Holocaust and the problems of refugees. As I said, we lived in Zagreb, and that's a picture of me when I was about 11 years old. I don't have any other pictures. In the meantime, Germany kept occupying more and more countries, and there was no place we could escape to. In 1941, when I was 13 years old, they bombed the capital of Yugoslavia, and the part where I lived came under the ruling of Dr. Ante Pavelic. He was a very, very cruel man immediately opened a concentration camp where they killed around about 200,000 people. And most of them got killed by having their throats cut. In one town in Kragujevac, a couple of German soldiers were shot by the resistance, so they went to a local school, just like yours. They picked up 200 students they marched them out of town and they shot them. Jews had to wear a yellow star. And as you can see, we had to wear the yellow star, not only in the front, but also on our backs. And when you walked on the street and there was a German soldier on the sidewalk, you had to step into the garden. You couldn't be on the sidewalk. My mother was afraid that something's going to happen to me and my sister, so she hid me with one family, one couple and my sister with another couple. And the couple that I was with, they worked for the resistance movement. And so for the next two years, I worked for the resistance movement. I was from the age of 13 to 15. I developed films, I made enlargements, I couldn't wear any shoes because the people in the apartment below would hear me. I couldn't go near the windows because people from the street would see me. And so I was hidden. I never got in touch with my friends. When I was 15 years old, there was a knock at the door and 
there were half a dozen Gestapo agents. Gestapo is the German st uh, street uh, secret police. They discovered the couple and they discovered me too. And they arrested the couple, they turned the place upside down and they arrested me, took me down to their headquarters and I was 15 at that time and they beat the living daylights out of me. I was bleeding and crying there all over the office. And then they locked me up in a basement cell. And I was there for three days. And after three days, they shipped me to a border town between Croatia and Slovenia. And I was locked up in a little cell that was filled with fleas, thousands of them. Uh, my legs got swollen, my face got swollen. I was itching and crying, it was, it was terrible. After that, they shipped me to Graz, Austria, and I found myself in this building, which still today is the police headquarters in Graz. I was up on the third floor, locked up in a little cell with three other kids. Two of them had been arrested for burglary, and the third kid had murdered his mother. And I was the fourth criminal there. And I was there for six weeks. And one day, I looked through the bars into the prison yard, and I saw my mother walking around in a circle there with some other women. And that's the last time I ever saw my mother. From there, I was shipped to Vienna. And in Vienna, I spent the night in this beautiful synagogue. Except by the time I came there, it didn't look like this anymore. It looked like this. It was destroyed during the night of the broken glass. There was glass and soot and water and dirt and torn prayer books. It looked terrible. And there were maybe a hundred other people there. And the next day we were put on a train and sent on a two-day trip to Czechoslovakia. And there we found ourselves in a place called Terezin. Look at the thickness of that wall. Look at the height of the wall. Look at the funny shape of that wall. Actually what it was it was an old fortress, 150-year-old fortress. But when planes were invented, fortresses were really useless because all you do is you fly over it and drop a couple of bombs. So the military moved out and civilians moved in. And when the Germans came and saw the fortress, they said, hey, this is great for a concentration camp. So what is a concentration camp? If you have lots of people who live very happily together, and one group thinks that they are so much better than the others, they can take all the others and concentrate them in one little area. And uh, once they are concentrated, there are lots of things you can do with them. You can do nothing with them. You can put them to work. You can work them to death. You can cut their throats. Or you can gas them. There were thousands of these camps throughout Europe. But this wasn't the first concentration camp that Germany had. They had 40 years before. They had, in Africa, concentration camps. And here are some of the natives. They lock, had locked up and starved them to death. Thousands had died there. This is the way the camp looked. Was old and dilapidated. No high official ever came 
Himmler was the highest official who occasionally went to some camps. This is how we slept. Then this is where we washed ourselves. And this is how people arrived. Actually, they didn't arrive like this until I came. I had to play these railroad tracks. Outside the wall, there was a lot of mud and they grew willow bushes there. And I had to cut these willow bushes and make baskets out of them. I also had to exterminate vermin from buildings by using this poison gas. I was there for 10 months. And then one day they brought in a hall lot of railroad cars like this, 25 of them, and they loaded us up 100 people per car. These were cattle cars. There were no chairs in it, no seats, nothing. They locked up the doors and they had to put in a bucket for each car and then they locked up the doors. And off we went on a three-day train ride. The buckets overflowed after an hour and for the next three days we were lying in our own feces and in our own urine. And then when they opened the door we were suddenly faced by a group of SS men and men in striped uniforms. And look at the picture carefully because you will see that every one of these men has a walking stick. And they were beating us with these sticks over the head, over the legs, in the face, wherever they could. The SS men had a standard SS uniform with a skull and crossbone, but they also had a skull and crossbone on their lapels. These were SS men who strictly worked in concentration camps. Behind us was a gate, underneath us was mud and dirt, and next to us was electrically charged barbed wire. And we asked, where are we? And they told us, you're in Auschwitz too, Birkenau, which was an extermination camp. In other words, a camp where they kill people, that's all. There were three Auschwitz camps. There was Auschwitz I, strictly for criminals who supervised us. There was Auschwitz III, which was a small factory, and then there was Auschwitz II, where we were. This is the way the camp looked. Everybody arrived at the green spot at the bottom, railroad tracks. And then most people were marched over to the red spots. Those were the places where they had the gas chambers, where they gassed people, and where they had the ovens where they burned the people. The area above the green spot were little camps of 5,000 people each, mostly men, and the area below the green spot was the women's camp. And over on the right, there was the camp that the Nazis had. And although the Allied troops knew what was going on, not one bomb ever fell on the gas chambers, on the railroad tracks, or on the German barracks. In other words, the good people did nothing. This is the way we looked. We had no hair, we had nothing. This is the way the women looked. And we all got a tattoo on our arms. And we also got a, our number on the uniform and a triangle. And depending why you were there, that's how the triangle was colored. So political prisoners were red, 
Gay people wear pink, Jehovah's Witnesses purple, gypsies black, Jews yellow, and thieves and murderers were light and dark green. There were also capos, which is short for camp police. And they had a band on their arms which said capo. And here you see a woman capo beating up another old woman. People arrived at the railroad tracks. There were SS men who sorted out all the old people, handicapped people, young children, and sent them to the gas chambers to be killed. This is how our barracks looked. There were six people on each level. And sometimes the top level fell on the middle level, in the middle on the lower level and kill the people on the lower level. This is a barrack after liberation, just to show you how crowded it was. And this is only half the people were there because the other half had left already on the death march. And this is a man's barrack after liberation. There are only three people on each level. The man in the middle has the only two properties that we had, a bowl and a spoon. And the bowl was filled in the morning with some brown water, and we got one slice of bread, which was made out of flour and sawdust. For lunch, we had soup, which was really salt water, into which a few small pieces of unwashed dirty potatoes were thrown in. And in the evening, we got another bowl of soup and we got another slice of bread, and that's it, that's all. Eating that food and not having any vitamins made us lose our teeth and also gave us diarrhea. And so, this is the toilet that we had to use. There was no toilet paper there. This was a bench they used for punishing people. If you didn't stand in line, if you didn't work hard enough, for any reason, you put your two feet in the holes in the bottom, and then you leaned over the bench like this, like this demonstration to General Eisenhower. One criminal held you by the arms, and the other one beat you with a stick. I've seen people dying on there. There was constantly mud and dirt all over. And three times a day, we had to stand between the barracks and be counted. And if one person was missing, we had to stand there and do push-ups or whatever until the person could be found. Or we used to do sport, which and we had to do leapfrog over each other until maybe a few people died. There was no way you could escape from the camp. There was electrically charged barbed wire, there were guard towers, there were German shepherds that had been trained to run after prisoners and tear them apart. And when a prisoner tried to escape, they caught him and they put a big sign around his neck. It says, cheer, cheer, I'm back here. And then they got punished. If they were lucky, they were hanged. If they were not lucky, they had terrible punishment for them. One man tried to escape and they took a barrel and they hammered nails from the outside of the barrel into the barrel, and they put the man in the barrel, closed it, and rolled it down a hill. Many people couldn't take the camp. They just committed suicide. This is one of the crematoria, one of these buildings where the gas chambers were in, and the ovens, and this is a typical gas chamber into which people were jammed. And uh, from through this hole in the ceiling, the poison gas pellets were dropped. 
And then once the people were dead, then another group of prisoners pulled them out of these gas chambers and removed their rings or gold teeth that they still had, burnt them in these ovens or in these pits. And all that remained of them were just boxes full of wedding rings piles of glasses, shoes, and empty suitcases. This is what we saw. People ask me sometimes, hey, what was the worst thing that ever happened to you while you were in the camp? The worst thing that happened to me was that I was 16 years old, and I didn't know from one day to the next whether I'm going to be alive. The air was constantly filled with the smell of burning hair and burning flesh. One day, Dr. Mengele came into the camp. Dr. Mengele was a German doctor who experimented with prisoners. He also liked to select people for the gas chamber. He was also known as the angel of death. And all the young men in the camp had to strip naked and we had to run past Dr. Mengele. And there was Dr. Mengele looking at us and we were running for our lives. We tried to look taller and stronger and healthier than we really could. And occasionally he was telling jokes with the other SS men and occasionally he nodded his head and somebody was removed from the line. And when he was finished with it, there were 300 of us on one side. And we had to look, run again, and then there were 200, and eventually there were 89 of us. And the 89 of us, we were sent to an adjacent camp with a barrack that had the gallows in the back. And most of the other 5,000 people in the other camp were then taken and over the next five days and killed. I was sent to Auschwitz I amongst the criminals to work in the stables. And for the next three, four months, I worked in the stables feeding the horses, but also stealing their food. They were eating sugar beets, so I stole that, and I ate that. In January 1945, which was the coldest winter on record in the 20th century, the Russians kept advancing. And we were each given a slice of bread. There were 60,000 of us and we started on a death march. We walked for a couple of hours and then we stopped. And those who couldn't get up were shot. And this went on hour after hour. First night we slept in some stables. And the next day we continued. There were bodies all over. And on the third day we arrived at the railroad siding. And uh, the, of the 60,000 who had left, 15,000 had died. And when we got to the railroad siding, there were open railroad cars like this. And they loaded us up into these cars. And then we went on a four day ride guarded by young boys, because all the SS men by this time were fighting the Russians. At one railroad station, we stopped. And next to me, there was a steam engine. And there was a man standing next to the steam engine. So I gave him a ball and 
asked him to fill it with the water from that came out of the piston. And so I got uh, half a bowl of warm water, which to me, to this day, was the best food I ever had in my entire life. Because I was frozen through and through. And this was the first time I had some really warmth in me. I can't remember the remaining part of the journey because I was too frozen. And we traveled from Auschwitz all the way to Austria, to Mauthausen. And we ended up in a concentration camp from hell. They forced prisoners to walk up 186 steps and then push each other off the cliffs into the valley. Prisoners were stripped naked in the winter and sprayed with water. We went through this gate and again we had mud, mud, mud. And then we were taken into one of these barracks and showered. And we all collapsed screaming with pain because all of us had suffered from frostbite. After three days, my feet started to rot. And there was a prisoner there who was a doctor before the war. He cut off my toes on one foot and so saved my life. He also cut off some pieces of the other foot. And then things got really worse because we were squeezed between Russian forces and American forces. There was no food there. We ended up getting a tablespoon of moldy bread a day. I slept next to a dead man for three days just to get his ration. This is the way we looked. This is not mud on his feet, this are his feces. There were bodies all over. And on the 5th of May, we were liberated by American forces. Those of us who were still alive looked like this. I was at that time 17 years old, and I weighed 64 pounds. And they gave us American military rations. And we ate these, and about 20,000 prisoners died from them. And then they brought in the local population, and they picked up the bodies, and they buried them in mass graves. I stayed on for about three weeks. Then I was given a piece of paper and uh, sent home. I had to hitchhike by train from Austria back to Yugoslavia. When I came to Yugoslavia, there was communism there. My father was dead, my mother was dead, my sister was nowhere to be seen. And I was there on my own. I stayed under communism for about two years. Then I managed to get out of Yugoslavia and I came to England, and I had a little problem. I had no schooling, my schooling stopped when I was 13. I had no skills, and I couldn't speak English. So I started working as a laborer, then as a machine tool fitter, then as a tool and die maker, and uh, I lived there for nine years. I came to the United States. I went to college at night for nine years. I was 10 years and I got my college degree. Whenever I see a sign like this, it sort of a, reminds me of what happened in the past what happened to me and my friends. When you see it, 
it should remind you of two things. Number one, that every one of you in this room is a target when it comes to the Nazis. Every one of them. And therefore it is up to you to fight anything like that, any racism in any form, any hate. And secondly, painting it is a crime. Just remember that in any oppression, whatever there may be, there are always four groups of people. There are the victims, there are the bully, the, the just people, and the bystander. The victims, well, they can be divided into two groups. One of group, they were dead. All we have is some nice tombstones, we have some statues, and in Europe, we have little plaques in the sidewalk. And the survivors, well, most of them ended up in displaced person camps, and uh, some of them went home and they were killed by local populations. And the remainder, they are scattered throughout the world. What about the bully and his gang? Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels committed suicide. And there were about 200, 300 trials after the war. But what happened to all these thousands of SS men? 9,000 of them had escaped to South America. 9,000. Amongst them, Dr. Mengele, the angel of death. He lived to, he drowned accidentally in Brazil in 1978. And then there were the just people. I like to call them the good people who did something. Their question was very simple. How do I save the lives of these people? How do I save the lives of people who are persecuted? Beep Geese, you should know her name. She saved the Frank family. She saved a total of eight people, actually. She tried to save them, one of them survived, the others all died. And when she was asked, why did she do it? She said, I did what any decent person would have done. There was Monsignor Hugh Flatty. He was an Irish priest in the Vatican, in the Pope's palace. He saved many, many thousands. He did all different things. He taught Jews to sing Latin songs. And when the Germans came to visit the Vatican, there was a Jewish choir singing Latin songs, the Germans thinking that they were Catholics. And when he was asked after the war, why did you do it? He said, well, it was the right thing to do. There was Dr. Ernst Leitz, a German manufacturer. They manufactured the Leica camera. He gave each of his Jewish employees a camera and gave them jobs in other countries. So this way they could sell the camera and had money. When asked why, he said it was the right thing to do. Then there was Senpo Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat. He saved about 6,000 people. He lost his job. He lost his health, but he said it was the right thing to do. And then there was Nicholas Winton. He was an Englishman. He went to Czechoslovakia, and he saw all these young children without parents. And uh, he said, I'm going to do something about that. 
And he saved this little girl. He saved 669 children. And I'm absolutely delighted that he saved this little girl. This little girl had been my wife for 61 years. And here she is with Sir Nicholas Wendy. Unfortunately, she died a couple of years ago. But when Nicholas went out, was asked, why did you do it? He said, it was the right thing to do. So, how do, do you do the right thing and be a just person? You judge the situation, you understand the problem, you solve it, and you take action. Don't just wait for people. This is how it is. Don't ever wait for others. Be the first to act. Because other people are waiting for you, you are waiting for them, and then guess what? Nothing's happening. And remember one thing, please. Just people are, just people. Just like you. 12 million people were murdered. Who is the murderer? Is it the person who pulls the trigger? Or the good people who don't stop him? What kind of a person will you be when you know someone is in need? You can be one of the good people who does nothing. You can be like a friend of Annabelle Cat. Another cat had lots and lots of friends. And they knew that she was doing drugs. They could have reported her and she could have been helped. She could have been cured. She could have been treated. Nobody said a word. She overdosed. She's dead. Or Audrey Pot. Somebody took a picture of her in the nude and posted it on the internet. Her friends knew it. They could have stopped it, but they didn't. She was so embarrassed, she committed suicide. She's dead. And these kids, they were all bullied. Their friends knew it. They were all bullied. They all committed suicide. They're all dead. So when should you speak up? If you know someone is bullied or suffers for any reason, speak up. Help without being asked. When you see that somebody is in need, open your mouth. It's very, very simple. You're not stupid little babies. You can think for yourself, you can act. Speak to your teachers, your principal, your security staff, your parents or guardians. But please, speak up. And please remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. And then nobody said it better. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. At the beginning of my presentation, I answered many questions. Now, by a show of hands, I'd like you to answer just one simple question. How many of you will promise to help a friend without being asked? Let's see. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very, very much. If you know something, say something. It will change two lives, your friends and yours. Because now you know what happens when we don't take care of each other. And please, don't be a silent friend. Thank you very, very much.
you have any questions whatsoever, I'm here to answer, but I need a teacher or somebody because I have very bad hearing, so I need somebody to repeat. Any questions? Come on. There's no such thing as a stupid question. The only stupid answers. Sandra, how many people use the, uh, how many survivors How many survivors were there? Do you think there still are? How many survivors do you think there still are of the Holocaust? I don't know. You see, the, the it, it's, I know I'm hedging it, you know. There are all different types of survivors. The term survivor is anybody who managed to uh, survive the war. There were people who were, uh, for instance, hidden in Europe who never left Europe. There were people who were, were who was, were in the camps like me. Of them, there are not that many. There were many people who escaped to uh, different countries, to America, to Great Britain, and so on. They are also called survivors. So it's a very, very broad uh, term. It, it's a very good question, but uh, uh, I don't know. I've heard some number about 200,000 or so. You know, so uh, if you want to take that number, you wouldn't be too far wrong, okay? But that's all together, not concentration camp survivors. There were not that many concentration camp survivors like me, okay? Does that answer your question? Good, thank you. Kim? Kim is wondering if you still have your tattoo. That yes, you I still have it. it. I, Usually charge if I show it, but I mean. It's a very personal thing. Thank you for showing us. Yeah. It's a small tattoo. Some people have huge tattoos, big tattoos, you know, across the whole arm. Mine was small. Look, it's, uh, it's a couple of years since I had it. <laughs> Survivor or escape? Yeah, escape. Yeah, escape. escape. How many people, she's trying to figure out how many people might have escaped. Again, escaping when? Okay, for, and from where? Uh, from Auschwitz, two. Two people actually successfully escaped. About 1,300,000 were brought to Auschwitz. 1,100,000 were killed in Auschwitz. So out of 1,300,000, uh, two people had escaped. Uh, there were quite a few people escaped during the last couple of months when the death marches left the various camps. There were some very small camps from which some people could escape, but for most of the major ones that we are talking about, very, very few. There was no chance. You see, escaping sounds uh, very easy and very good when you, when you, let's say, you have the move in the movies, but Take Auschwitz, 
Let's first of all, the population was very anti-Semitic. And they were also, if you hit somebody and they caught you, you were killed. So nobody wanted to risk their lives hiding somebody. Then you had to know the language, you had to know where you are. We had striped uniforms, we had no money. You know, even if you escaped, so what? You know, what do you do then? Uh, so it, it's, uh, there are more parts to this than just getting on the other side of the wall. Do we have any other question? Yeah, we have uh, yeah. Do you ever know what happened to your sister? What, the question was what happened to my sister. My sister lived with, the, with another family, as I mentioned, and uh, after a year they said to her, listen, it's getting too dangerous for us, we don't want you anymore. So they tossed my sister out. And my sister didn't know what to do, so she escaped to Italy. Now, escaping to Italy is like uh, escaping from New York, New Jersey, uh, from uh, Norwalk to New York, New Jersey. You know, it's not a huge distance. And she escaped to Italy, and there she was promptly arrested by the Italians and put in an Italian detention camp. The Italians were always very nice to the Jews. There was no animosity, but the Nazis insisted that they have these camps. But they were not concentration camps. The families stayed together, but it was miserable because there was no food there anyway. You know, there was, the general population didn't have food and the people in the camp didn't have food. They got diseases and uh, some people died. But anyway, she survived and then she came to the United States and when I came to the United States, we got reunited. And uh, she died in 1999. But thank you for asking. How did I survive? Because of my good looks, my sunny disposition, my great wisdom, no. Pure luck. 100% luck, nothing else. Because, uh, you know, everything that happened was a matter of luck. I could have frozen to death, I could have caught any number of diseases, Dr. Mengele could have been told a good joke and he looked in the other direction while I was running by. Uh, I, you know, I mean, the chances of me uh, surviving are minuscule. You know, was, was strictly anybody who tells you any different, you know, than pure luck is making up stuff. There's no such thing as even I've known people who, who managed to survive in the camp, uh, you know, and then eventually get, in, you know, through some manipulations and befriending as S-men and then dying because of diseases. So, just luck. Do you ever know what happened to your bunkmate? What happened to your bunkmate? To my bunkmates? To, to the people he was in the bunks with, the cabins? Yeah. The ones who okay, right. I, there were all these bunkmates with me. Uh, I know only of one. One bunkmate with whom I was friendly. The guy who lay next to me. I don't know if I should tell you this. To hell with it. <laughs> I will. I was... There was a man 
then next to me, and he was very, very friendly to me. He treated me really nice. He was from Germany. And uh, one day I came back to the bunk, and there he was sitting there on top of the bunk. And he had a deck of cards. And I couldn't believe it. Because nobody had anything, you know. We didn't have a pencil. We had nothing. And there he sat with the deck of cards. And he showed me, he said, here, shuffle these cards. So I shuffled the card and said, take the card. And I took the card, I looked at it, he put it back in the deck, and he showed me a card trick. And then he explained the card trick to me. And I remember the trick for the next year or so. I had no access to any cards whatsoever. He was a German magician who the Nazis found out that he's a magician. So they gave him cards and they gave him little coins or what, and he performed tricks for the Nazis and that's how he survived. And then when the war, when the camp was broken up, he went on a death march, he went to another camp, he survived that camp. He eventually came to the United States and he was a magician on cruise ships and other places and conventions. I didn't know that. Until one day I read about his death. In between, I got interested in magic and I performed magic and I became a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. I came back yesterday from a very large magic convention where I was interviewed and maybe for a thousand people and I know many magicians. And that man, as I said, survived. That's the only person I know as far as my bunk mates is concerned. Did I start a new life? Oh, very much so. I, I came here, my wife and I, we came here with two suitcases. That's it. We had no money whatsoever. We had two suitcases with clothing. That's it, finished. We had nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. We lived first in a room with, with, that somebody rented us. We couldn't even cook our own meals. We just ate sandwiches for the first few weeks. There was no way we, we either ate in the restaurant. We both started with nothing. My wife found a job, I found a job, and then I started going to school at night, and I had a job, and then we had a child, and I continued working and studying. And after 10 years, I got my college degree. And uh, I had two children by that time. It was hard, but you can do it. You know, all of us have bad experiences in our lives. All of us. I will, I'm not the only one who has bad experience. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you the story of
the two prisoners. They were locked up in a prison cell and they looked through the bars in the prison yard. One of them saw mud and the other one saw stars. Look at the stars. Forget about the mud. It's my advice to you and to everybody else. Um, how did you meet your wife? How, how did, did you meet your wife? How did, how did I meet my wife? I went to a small play in well, I lived in London and uh, she had volunteered to give out programs and uh, during the, the play was partly in German and part in English and she couldn't speak German and she sat next to me, you know, after she finished giving out the programs, I was in the last row and I was tr translating German puns into English. Don't ever try to do that, it's very difficult. And so we got to talk and so on. And then the next time we went to the movie, movies together, and then we went out for four years, and then we were married for 61. And then uh, we were very, very, very good friends. Okay? So when you get married, make sure you find a good friend. Okay? Promise? Uh, one more question, Chris? Maybe between the story, I can't imagine all that you've been through. What, what was it like mentally for you to go through the day-to-day, -day, um, just being surrounded by death, being surrounded by everything the Nazis put you through? How did you, how did you get through that? Uh, he says he can't imagine how difficult it was to go through what you went through and how did you, on a daily basis, deal with seeing all the death and the brutality? Is that right, Chris? While I was in the camp? Just, just in general, yes, being in the camp. In, uh, let me tell you one thing. The, you will have difficulties with that because you're not a kid anymore. I was a teenager. And a teenager thinks that they are indestructible and uh, they will survive. That's why they do stupid things. You know, they take dope, they drive at 80 miles an hour into oak trees and they do all these wonderful things, you know. This is sort of a suddenly, when you get older, you suddenly realize it really doesn't work that way. But uh, I was a teenager, and secondly, we had a very, very positive outlook in Auschwitz. Because if you didn't, the only alternative was death. And I mean death, terminal. That's it, finished. And we saw it. We saw it lying on the ground. We smelled it in the air. Okay? And we, we used to say in Auschwitz, I'm happy that I'm in Auschwitz. If I wouldn't be happy, I'd still be in Auschwitz. Might as well be happy. That was our attitude. And uh, it worked. And I knew I'm going to survive. And as you can see, I was right. Unfortunately, thousands and thousands were wrong. But they are not here to tell you about it. Anyone else that you want to ask before we... Um... How long did it take before you told your story? How long did it take before you told your story? I didn't say anything about it until maybe 50 years after. I... My, I didn't hide the story from my kids. You know, they knew a little bit here, a little bit there, but I didn't walk around with a 
uh, the world owes me something. The world owes me nothing. Okay? I'm an uh, extremely happy and fortunate person. Uh, the li life has been good to me, has been extremely good to me, because I'm alive and the others are not. So I have no complaints. My sons knew where I was and what happened to me during the war. I didn't sit them down and say, sons, let me tell you my story. No, over the years, a little bit here, a little bit there. They sort of, they didn't, but I certainly didn't give them a guilt feeling or anything like that. It's about 25 years ago, something like that, that I retired. And uh, I saw in the local newspaper that the local high school is uh, giving a Holocaust study course. So I called them up and said, hey, do you need an exhibit? You know, I'm available. Uh, and they said, yeah, come on up and uh, see what you can do. So I came into a class, it was a small room, and I told them my story. And they gave me 35 minutes, 37 minutes, whatever it was, and I told them the story in about 20 minutes, you know, so I rammed it down their throats, and uh, then they started asking me stupid questions. And I was an industrial engineer, and one of the most important questions that anybody can ever ask you is a stupid question. Because it means that either they didn't understand your lecture, they didn't have the knowledge, or you didn't explain it properly enough. And I listened to these questions because there were questions such as, was the food kosher in Auschwitz, you know? Uh, you know, what did you do over the weekends in Auschwitz? You know, questions like that. So uh, they heard the word camp, I was in camp to them, it was summer camp, you know? And uh, so I started, uh, I had too many answers. So I started doing uh, overhead slides. And that worked, uh, but every time when I spoke, I had to pick up these damn slides off the floor. They invariably fell all over. And uh, some woman came up to me one day and said, you know, I, my son could put this, give you a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, so she introduced me to her 14 year old son. And I hate kids like that, you know. <laughs> and so the first PowerPoint slide presentation I did then, and then I mean, these are all my own now since, yeah, no, I, I it was years ago since uh, this happened. And uh, so every time I hear something, I hear a stupid question. And as you can see, there were no stupid questions today, you know, which is proof that my presentation has all the information in it. Do we have any other questions? We have time for just one more. How many copies did your book sell? Did your book sell? Right. Oh, go ahead. How many copies of your book sold? Uh, I don't know. I just came back from a magician's convention and they sold out all the books. Uh, I, I was a speaker there and they, they sold out all the books. I haven't got the slightest idea. And uh, because I got detached from that book, you see, I wrote an agreement.
they gave me a little bit of money and I gave them the biography, but I'm writing another, I wrote another book and I hope to make money out of that. Lots of money. <laughs> Piles. <laughs> Listen, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, please take care of each other. Take care of each other. You can't do it on your own. Nobody can do it on their own. You need the help of others. Give it to them. And they will give you help as well. God bless you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much.